Yes, we are. Yes, uh, yes. Good. Report is also started. So we have lecture number 12 today. I will take another chalk. Lecture number 12. I would like, yeah, I hope you see it. So we start some work in the field. And we start with the terminology. Okay. Let's go to this new fact which preceded the epidemic to result in the discovery of superconductivity. Uh, first of all, in 1911, Is there anything wrong? Okay. In 1911, that physicist, I'm really honest, I, I hope I spell this correctly, if not, I apologize, discovered that liquid mercury being cooled down below certain temperature demonstrates <coughs> very unusual behavior of resistivity. So typically in metals, um, resistivity goes down with lowering temperature. But from there to me, it appears that at some temperature, there is a sudden drop of resistivity. And below this temperature, liquid mercury, so this is mercury, <coughs> was conducting current without any velocity. Well, I'm talking about sufficiently small currents. Um, and this started age of uh, superconductivity. Then later, many other systems, many other metals, where it started with a different uh, temperature of the superconducting transition. In particular, for me, um, TC is often so Kelvin. Um, for niobium, TC was 9.25 Kelvin. Then for tungsten, It was extremely low, 0518, 15 Kelvin. And since 2000, uh, since 1980, 1911, until 1995, so we started in 1911, 1995, the highest possible temperature of about 24 Kelvin was discovered for niobium 3 germanium L. So you see almost 85 years um, the increased temperature superconducting transition just for 20 Kelvin. And of course, starting with the beginning of superconductivity, discovering superconductivity. It was very challenging uh, to find a material with highest possible temperature for conducting transition. In particular, all this temperature belongs to the so-called helium range of temperatures. So in order to cool down these materials to um, these uh, temperatures, to prepare a system below critical temperature, one needs to use liquid helium. Um, the first challenge was to find the material which can superconduct, not if not at room temperatures, then at temperatures of liquid nitrogen, which is 77. So this was the challenge, and you see 85 years, almost no success. 
fall into uh, that high temperature. And in 1995, there was a breakdown. Sorry, in 1985. I, I, I think just 1985. So I was talking about almost 75 years then. Um, the superconductivity was discovered in plantarium copper side. Plantarium 2, copper, or four. Um, this system was docked either with strontium or uh, with putting, uh, with removing some oxygen, creating flows, and critical temperature for this material was about 40 degrees. <coughs> Big success, although it's still below the temperature of liquid nitrogen. So, the very next year, yet another system, namely lithium, iron, two, Upper three or seven minus delta was discovered where the critical temperature was about 90 Kelvin. So, discovery of plantarium waste system was done by two uh, physicists, Bednor and Müller, working at IBM, which they published in Switzerland. Mr. Gentlemen, got very soon the Nobel Prize for discovery of high temperature superconductors. This is the beginning of the age of high temperature superconductors. We are going to discuss. Uh, the Sorry, what is delta, uh, Professor? What is well, delta? Delta, as I said, this is not the chemistry system. Delta is a concentration of holes. So people took out some oxygen from the system. So stoichiometric system is like that. Sometimes in literature, you don't use one for the heat because this is each room, iron, copper, side. But uh, the system is not superconducting in the stoichiometric configuration. One needs so called to, to dock it. The dotted occurs either to put some substitution um, like bronzum or you remove some oxygen by chemical preparation. Um, and uh, the point is that the system, which is in stoichiometric configuration, is insulated. And actually, this is a ceramic, so it's basically powder. Uh, when you remove some oxygen, uh, from um, this uh, system, at certain critical concentration, delta, it starts to superconduct. When you increase concentration of holes more and more, it reaches the maximum of superconducting transition. Um, this is 90 Kelvin, and if you talk more, the superconductivity decays and eventually goes down. So the temperature of superconducting transition goes down again. So, but the point is that people were looking for the best methods in order to find the highest possible temperature superconducting transition, but it appears that bad methods for insulation being docked by impurities become good superconductors. Hello, Professor. Hello? Yes. I, I cannot hear clearly all that you are speaking. I don't know if any other person has the same problem. Look, I, I I'm trying to hear you, but we tested one hour ago. We tested, we recorded, and it was fine. If something happened meantime, I'm sorry, I can speak slow, I can speak louder if necessary, but this is all what I can do. Can you hear me now? You speak slowly. Um, Louder. Yeah, I mean, for me, I can hear you fine. You cannot hear me, Paul? No, for me, I can hear you clearly, for me. Okay, then probably please check your headphone headset because 
or use internal speaker of your laptop. I'm really sorry. For for my case, if I use my headset, I cannot hear you. But if I like uh, use the speaker, it's, it's a bit louder, but sometimes it makes some words. Again, look, either I stop now and ask Massimo, go and call him and try to test, or I'm, you Massimo, ask him. I'm connected. To... So the, the quality, uh, the sound quality in the, um, I don't know which room, yeah, the first lecture was so good. Sorry, I'm, con I'm connected. We know that the other room is another sound quality, but uh, this is what we can do in this room. So if you can uh, raise your volume locally, because the signal, uh, I'm connected, I'm uh, hearing well, but I have to raise the volume of my computer. Actually, I max this 100% already. But please use your internal speaker. If possible, don't use headsets. What else can we do? Shall we continue or what shall I do? Is oh, oh, what about the other students? Look, please raise your hand those who have problem with sound or put exclamation mark in chat so we know how deep the problem is. So I see Lian, I see Maha, I see Olaya, I see Julia, I see Valerius, I see uh, Pelush. Professor? Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. When you are speaking now uh, slowly, we can hear you clearly and understand you clearly, I guess, at least for me. So maybe when you are uh, writing and uh, speaking uh, in the side of Blackboard that we cannot uh, hear you clearly. Okay, I try them to be faced to the microphone and speak slow. Okay. But please interrupt me if the problem still persists. And on Monday in this area room, was it better quality? Yes, when I did yes. the last lecture from different room. Yeah, it was better on Monday in the other, other room than today. Okay. Let me try to continue for like five minutes. And you tell me after five minutes. Is it bad or not? Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, I continue with my questions. What I mean is, what is the range of the delta? Uh, and uh, what uh, criteria control the range of the delta? So delta in the possible domain is 2.18. So the phase diagram of this high temperature superconductors, these are folded off. So if I put temperature versus concentration of carriers, as I said for zero delta, this is zero. The system is insulating and anticarbonating. And insulating. Then there is optimal doping, 0.18. And then there is a superconducting dome, which looks like that. So in this area, the system is superconducting. Moreover, it's very asymmetric. Um, it's not symmetric with respect to so-called optimal dome. This is optimal. The area below optimal dome is called underdome. The area above optimal doping is called order. The optimal doping corresponds to maximum temperature of uh, superconducting transition. This is very literal phase diagram. Of course, uh, in reality, there are both phases. 
here, for example, there is a stimulus. Then there is area of course, pseudo gap where the system uh, behaves not like a thermal liquid. Uh, all the systems demonstrate pronounced behavior of strongly correlated systems. And in principle, I'm going to devote half of the lecture uh, about properties of strongly correlated systems at the end of the course. So I will come back uh, to the space diagram. But this is how it looks like. Until 1985, it was a normal support of community to understand what stands behind the high temperature superconductivity in order to find out what people should do in order to reach maximum temperature of superconductive change. All the systems I'm speaking now are called Cooper Oxide Superconductor. And talking about these systems, about general properties of the system, I should say that all of them are ceramics, which is bad, because as I said, technologically this is a powder, and one cannot make wires out of powder. Um, although the temperature superconducting transition is high enough, it's not good for producing wire. And therefore, it's not good to produce a superconducting magnet in order to transfer electricity and so on and so forth. Um, so the systems are quasi two dimensional. All of them contain copper and oxygen, uh, which form planes. So it's sort of sandwich uh, system. So at that time, this is a big thing of um, superconducting uh, materials with the highest possible temperature for now in the mercury based eastwood and sodium copper oxides. The highest temperature is about 170 Kelvin, which you see is high enough. And this is all about copper oxide material. <coughs> For more than 10 years, there was another new system of materials which called three types. Uh, they contain uh, iron and arsenicum. These systems are much better metals. Um, and this is another big family of um, three types. Um, however, the critical temperature for this superconducting material is not yet at nitrogen range. So the highest you see is of the order 60 Kelvin. <laughs> and of course, I'm talking about superconductivity at ambient pressure. For more than five years, we have new discoveries of room temperature superconductivity, uh, however, at very high pressures. This is also called, um, these are mostly sulfur systems. So, these are either hydro sulfur, um, very simple materials, but the pressure at which they superconduct is about 200 gigapascal. So, you see that this is really very, very high pressure. I'm not going to review all possible materials of high temperature superconductors now. I would rather go down to basics uh, and key facts which precede construction of one of the most powerful technological theory, which is Ginsburg conductor. Can you hear me better now or not? Yes, it's better. Then, I said this historical remarks, and what a part of the growth of the resistivity was so intriguing for the superconductors. So now I'm going to speak about conventional superconductors, namely this sort of materials. I'm not touching the high temperature superconductivity during this lecture. So the second intriguing observation was that magnetic field does not penetrate into the superconductor. To compare with, if we have a normal metal and we put it in a magnetic field, the lines of magnetic field go inside the metal. 
However, in superconductor, it appears that the line of a field are going such a way that magnetic field does not penetrate inside the bulk of the system. And this is called Meissner effect. In today's lecture, I'm going to give you a very simple explanation of this Meissner effect. Then, and all these discoveries um, occurred around 1930. Then, people measured specific heat for the superconducting material, like America. And specific heat behave in a very peculiar way, which, as we learned it uh, during Monday lecture, is characteristic for second order phase transition. So there is a jump of the specific heat at the critical temperature of the transition, and moreover, specific heat to the left is bigger than specific heat to the right. There is a jump. <coughs> Besides, the measurement of the specific heat at very low temperature demonstrated that the specific heat is exponentially suppressed. It's e to the power minus delta over temperature. This is a fit of the curve at very low temperatures, much smaller than the temperature of superconducting transition. This behavior is specific for the system which spectrum is gapped. I gave you a problem when we discussed uh, superfluidity to compute contribution to specific heat from rotors. And what you need to obtain, and what you're supposed to obtain, that specific heat is exponentially suppressed at low temperatures for those excitations which are gapped. Then the gap itself, as a function of temperature, subtracted from these experiments, this is a gap in the spectrum. Demonstrate again characteristic behavior for the second order phase transition, so it behaves as Tc minus T over Tc. So we already learned that magnetic field doesn't penetrate, and there is a gap. Yet another experiment um, was done to measure a tunnel contact between normal metal and superconductor. So there are two materials. One is normal, another one in superconducting state. They put in a close contact and they put into electric circuit, connected to the battery. And then what we expect for the normal metal, I am plotting current as a function of applied voltage. For normal metal, we know we have Ohm's law. which tells us that the current is proportional to the voltage. And the coefficient between current and voltage is called conductance. Um, however, in this tunnel contact between normal metal and superconductor, the Iron curve was like that. So it was highly nonlinear, and it stopped at some critical voltage, which again tells that in order to conduct the electron, you need to overcome the energy gap. It was another independent confirmation that the system, the spectrum of elementary excitations is characterized by the gap. Okay, these are the facts which um, we had uh, before. And now, let me start with a simple phenomenological theories explaining some of these effects. Okay? Good. The next paragraph which I'm going to discuss is electrodynamics of superconductors. In the next 15 minutes, 
I would like to explain the Meissner the Meissner effect. So, what was the logic of theory? People immediately recognized that superconductivity and superfluidity has a lot of common properties. So to say in the superconducting state, people assume again, <coughs> as a phenomenology. Uh, I start with phenomenology, which means it will be sort of theory based on assumptions and not referring to any microscopic mechanisms. After two lectures, this lecture and Friday lecture, I will come to microscopic theory, which will be based on sort of interaction between electrons. Um, so phenomenology means I do some assumptions and the first assumption was that like in superfluid helium, we have two sorts of liquids. One is normal component and another one is superconducting component. And moreover, for the superconducting part, we assume that we can characterize the superconductor as a collective effect by unique wave function, the same as we did for superfluidity. So we are saying that the wave function is square root of ms and i to the power chi, <coughs> where chi is the phase. Now, let me write down the superconducting current. So, I'm only considering this superfluid or superconducting component of the liquid, and this ms is the density of super fluid superconducting component. The same way as I did it for superfluid, I will write now the charge current. For superfluid, which was neutral, I consider it the mass current. The only difference between mass and charge current is that I need to multiply everything what I get by the charge. However, people didn't know what are the carriers. Therefore, the first phenomenological constructions we are done assuming that the charge of the carrier is e star and the mass of the carrier is m star. Surprisingly, people realized later that E star is equal exactly to twice charge of the electron and m star is, going, is equal exactly to twice mass of the electron. But by constructing of what I'm going to present now, it was not yet known and was not assumed. This actually was indication that the superconductivity is related to some composite particle, which was called Cooper pair, which is responsible for superconducting process. We discuss it Monday next week. Okay, the superfluid current is um, I h bar over two. M star, E star, and as before, we have psi nabla psi star minus psi star nabla psi. And if we do that, the very same way as we did it for the superfluid, we will get that the superconducting superfluid current is H bar over E M star. Um, E star um, then we have a gradient of the phase and we have a superfluid density. So we can write it down as E star multiply the superconducting velocity times the superfluid density. So this is the superfluid or superconducting current. The very same way as we did it for the superfluid. Now, let's see how we can uh, write down the same current in the presence of magnetic field. And I remind you that if we add magnetic field to the system, we need to replace the momentum, which is minus I h bar nabla. This is quantum mechanical operator of the momentum to 
minus i h bar nabla minus e star over c a. You remember that quantum mechanics provide a gauge invariant uh, description, um, and a is vector potential, so nabla a is equal to magnetic field b applied to the system. We need to be more careful, uh, actually careful enough, in order to write down this expression before I do this substitution. So let me rewrite it this way, h e star over 2 m star, and I will write it as psi dagger minus i nabla psi. Um, I will, I put minus i here, plus psi dagger minus i nabla psi dagger. You can check that what I wrote is correct, because this is this term, and this is this term. You see, it comes with a plus i. So now I'm ready to make the elongation of my derivatives, and what I get that gs is equal to, so this is e star h bar over m star. Now, in addition to gradient of chi, I get minus e star over hc times a. So my superconducting velocity now <coughs> contains the vector potential. Okay? So this is a superconducting current in the presence of magnetic field. And now, if I apply operation of Nabla, I repeat you that this is the same that rota A is equal to B. If I apply operator nabla to the right hand side and left hand side of my equation, I get nabla times Js is equal to E star h bar over m star. There is ms here, ms. Then, nabla times nabla times um, chi minus e star over hc nabla times a. Let's look at these two terms. This is rotor of gradient. And rotor of gradient is equal to zero. The same way as we did it for super, super fluid component. Here we have a magnetic field. So we got equation that rotor of the superfluid current is equal to minus E star square. H bar cancels out. We have superfluid density, ms, divided by m star c times magnetic field. So we got very important equation, which is called London equation. Now, I would like to do some very simple calculations with vectors. And I don't know if you had it in tutorials or not. But I will put summary of important equations which I need to use. I will do it in the tender form, and your homework is either to learn it if you didn't know it before, or refresh your knowledge following to what I'm going uh, to say. So I remind you how differential operators look like. So suppose we have Nabla 
applied to some vector C. This in the different language is called divergence of the thing C. In the tender notations, I'm going to write it as D over DX alpha C alpha. I'm not discriminating within covariant and co contravariant um, variables, but this is means that this is D over DX CX plus D over DY CY plus D over DZ CZ. This is notation which I'm going to use. If I apply operator nabla as a vector form to the vector C, this is a vector, this is a scalar. This is a vector uh, or pseudo vector to be, if I'm interested in one of the components of this vector, which I denote alpha. This is epsilon alpha beta gamma d over dx beta c gamma. So this is notation where epsilon alpha beta gamma is so-called levi chilita tensor. This tensor is equal to zero if any two indices are equal to each other. The tensor is equal to one if you have a cyclic uh, permutation one, two, three, three, one, two, two, three, one, um, and equal to minus one other way around. So this is Levi Chilita tensor. Um, the gradient of some function phi is df over dx alpha times e alpha. So this is a vector. Therefore, if I apply nabla to nabla f, what I get from here, I'm interested in component uh, in a component alpha. Um, I have epsilon alpha beta gamma d over d x beta and gamma component of this. So this is d over d x gamma f. So you see, since I can write this permuting these two indices again, and this will give me additional minus, which means that this is exactly zero. This is a very simple proof that the rotor of gradient is equal to zero. Okay? Are you familiar with this notation? Because now I'm going to rush a little bit and use these two formulas in order to compute and derive equation for magnetic field, uh, which will then give me explanation of the Meissner effect. Superfluid current or superconductor, it doesn't matter because I'm saying that superconductivity is superfluidity of some charged objects. Good. So I got equation. I will write it here that nabla times Gs is equal to minus E charge square M charge C and S times B. Okay. But if you don't understand the way I'm doing my calculation, please let me know. By the way, these notations where I put repeating indices assumes that I have a summation. This is sum of alpha equal to x, y, z, d over d, x alpha, c alpha. So anytime I'm writing something which contains repeated indexes, like here I'm taking summation of a beta and gamma. Well, indices, when indices repeat, it assumes summation. These are Einstein notations. So I have one equation which while I obtained assuming that um, there is a superfluidity of some charged object, 
and I need to add to this equation the Maxwell equation, which tells me that nabla applied to magnetic field is equal to 4 pi over C times GS. <coughs> I remind you that this equation and nabla applied to B equal to zero, these are two Maxwell equations. So, in order to um, derive the closed equation for magnetic field, let me apply differential operator nabla to the left hand side and right hand side of the equation. So, nabla times nabla times JS is equal to minus E star square over M star C and S times B. So, nabla times B. Okay? Now, from the first equation, I see I'm working with the right hand side. Right hand side. If the right hand side nabla applies to B from maximum equation, this is 4 pi divided by C. Um, uh, the superconducting current. Sorry, let me see what I'm going to do. Um, no, sorry. Let me do it other way around. Let me apply what I'm doing is correct. If I do so, I will get closed equation for the superconducting current, but this is not what I need. I will do it applying operator nabla to this equation. So nabla times nabla times B, because I want to get equation for the magnetic field. This is equal to 4 pi over C, nabla times GS. Okay, from the London equation, this is this one, in the right hand side, right hand side, I get that this is equal to minus 4 pi E star square over M star C square times Ns times magnetic field. I will call this coefficient as one of the lambda square. So this is minus B divided by lambda square. And one over lambda square is equal to four pi E star square over M star C square times Ns. Let me see what happens in the left hand side. In order to do it, I will write one of the components of it. So I'm going to calculate nabla times nabla times B component of this is epsilon alpha beta gamma D over D X beta. Now gamma component of this epsilon gamma mu nu D over D X mu D nu. So in this expression, only alpha is free index. I take a summation of index beta, I take a summation of index gamma, I take a summation of index mu, and I take a summation of index nu. So I have a product of two tensors Levi Civita. And in this product, I can cyclically permute the indexes. So I write down that epsilon gamma alpha beta times epsilon gamma mu nu. Product of two Levi Civita tensors is equal to determinant delta alpha mu 
delta alfa nu, delta beta nu, delta beta nu. So this is delta alpha nu, delta beta nu, minus delta alpha nu, delta beta nu, where delta are Kronecker symbols. So if I plug it in here, the first term, delta alpha is equal to mu. Uh, therefore, I have um, d over dx beta, d over dx alpha, and beta is equal to mu, d beta. You see, again, I have only one repeatable index. This is the first term. Now with this one, minus d over dx beta. Now beta alpha is equal to mu, and beta is equal to mu. It's again d over dx beta and d alpha. Now, d over dx beta b beta. This is divergence of b. This is zero. Here, d over 2 over dx beta squared. This is Laplacian. So in the left hand side of my equation, which I will repeat here, I have minus Laplacian b is equal to minus 1 over lambda squared b. Do you understand what and how I did? Yes. Sorry? Yes. Okay, good. Or if I multiply by minus 1, I got a closed equation for the magnetic field. Great. Now, let's assume that we have, we, we are solving simple problem of a flat boundary between normal metal and superconducting metal. So, suppose we have a superconductor here, we have Z axis applied here, and we have a normal metal here. We have a magnetic field D, which contains component parallel to the boundary plus component perpendicular to the boundary, maybe Z. <coughs> but since geometry assumes that I have only one perpendicular direction, the magnetic field can depend only on Z axis. So everything is isotropic in perpendicular direction. There is no any other variable. So this system is then corresponds to system of two equations. I will write separately equation for the normal component and for tangential component. For normal component, d2 over dz squared dz is equal to 1 over lambda squared dz. But in the left hand side, we have d over dz, d over dz, dz. This is divergence of B, and this is equal to zero. Therefore, the left hand side is equal to zero. In the right hand side, we have one over lambda squared BZ. Therefore, we obtain that BZ is equal to zero. This is from solving this equation for the normal component. For tangential component, d2 over dz squared 
p parallel is equal to 1 over lambda square b parallel. The solution of this equation is p parallel as a function of z. So this is this component is equal to b parallel at the boundary times e to the power minus z over lambda. Okay? Which means that magnetic field exponentially decays inside the superconductor. So to say it penetrates inside the superconductor only into the part of the width lambda. And therefore, lambda is called penetration depth. So magnetic field is repelled from the superconductor because, as we see, superconductor is ideal diamagnet. We discussed diamagnetism in the one of the first lectures, and we said that the current creates a magnetic field which is anti-parallel to external magnetic field, such way that resulting magnetic field inside of the diamagnet is reduced. <coughs> Here in superconductors, the magnetic field which is induced due to the current, I can derive the equation for the current, and I leave it to you as a problem. This is what I start to do. I can write down similar equation for the superfluid current, superconducting current, and show that the current produced on the boundary creates a magnetic field which exactly compensates external magnetic field, and therefore magnetic field does not penetrate into the superconductor. This is a Meissner effect. In conclusion, what we see is that in order to explain the Meissner effect, it was sufficient to think about superfluidity. Okay? Good. Now, we have some sorry, implied... Uh, sorry, Professor. Can you yes. explain again the connection with the superfluidity? Well, I started from very beginning saying that I have the global wave function, psi, which is square root over ms times i to the current. Yes. This was my only assumption. And with this wave function, I computed expectation value of the current. And I obtained that the current consists of two parts. First part um, is potential. It's proportional to the gradient of chi. Or this is a part magnetic current. But then there is a part which is proportional to the vector potential. Um, this is direct, actually, consequence from this form of the wave function. And then I combine it with Maxwell equation, and I obtain that magnetic field exponentially decayed inside the superconductor. So to put my initial assumption and conclusions, I see that to suppose that there is a superfluid component, which is characterized by the global wave function with the phase is sufficient to show that the diamagnetic current compensates the magnetic field, produce magnetic field, which exactly compensates the magnetic field, external magnetic field, and therefore field inside the superconductor is equal to zero. Would I not assume that? I will not get this result. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. Good. So now, as I said, we have roughly half an hour. And I'm going to start the derivation for so called Ginsburg Landau theory. What I hope to succeed today, I will go extremely slow because this is important. Uh, what, I hope, what I hope to succeed today is to derive first Ginsburg Landau equation. And we continue Friday, we derive second Ginsburg Landau equation, 
we derive uh, dimensional Gilbert Fandau equations and we discuss properties what can be learned from the, this still phenomenological theory of superconductor. In a tutorial with Andre at the end of the next week, you will see how to apply this Gilbert Fandau theory to description of the vortices in the superconductor. So I derive equations and they will show you how to work with these equations. Um, good. Um, and if time permits, next week at the end of the lecture, after deriving second Ginsburg Landau equation, we discuss Joseph and Joseph's own effect. So everything what I'm going to say today and on Friday is then will be related to very vicinity of the superconducting transition point. So it's not describing the whole range of temperatures, but just vicinity when we close to critical temperature. Next week, when we start to discuss microscopic theory, we derive yet another system of equations, which will be valid everywhere, including the vicinity of superconducting transition point. And we will see how this Ginsburg landau theory which I present today phenomenologically can be derived from the microscopic theory. So it will actually complete the story. So as we see, this superconductivity is, as we assume, related possibility to describe our system by the global wave function, which is a modulus times exponent to the power of phase. And we consider this wave function, namely this superfluid component, as the order parameter. And therefore, in the spirit of what I have introduced during last lecture on Monday, I will consider the Gibbs free energy as a functional of the complex quantity, which is the wave function. And I will write it down as I note plus, and I'm writing down the integral over dr. <coughs> so I assume that my order parameter, which is wave function, depends on coordinate, it fluctuates. And therefore, I will first write terms which you are familiar with because of the Landau theory of phase transition. So this is A psi modulus square over R plus B half psi modulus 4. You may ask me why I'm writing A and B half instead of A half and B over 4, which I used in previous time. Because now I'm considering theory for two component order parameter. So the order parameter is two component. And without losing generality, I can assume the two linearly independent variables are psi and psi star. So there are two components of the order parameter. Therefore, when I will differentiate with the psi of psi star, I will just get the factor one, so this is psi star psi. This is the generalization of the theory. And you remember last time I wrote a half pi squared plus b over four pi to the four. Here, the order parameter is scalar and one component. When I differentiate with pi, I get factor two, which compensates this, and factor four, which compensates that. So, this was easy part of the functional. And again, the difference between function and functional is that the free energy depends on the function, which it some, itself depends on the coordinate. So then, since I assume that the order parameter is coordinate dependent, I will write something which is kinetic energy. So I will write two. Kinetic energy is P squared over 2n. But I already told you that 
people realize that effective mass M star is a twice mass of the electron. Therefore, I will write in M. And the kinetic energy is minus I H nabla. I will assume that the system is in magnetic field, minus 2 E of C. I use the fact that effective charge E star is equal to twice charge of the charge of the electron. So this is kinetic energy, P squared over 2 M. And what remains is to write down the term with the magnetic field. Okay, so I have two fields or two quantities which change. <coughs> I have my wave function, which depends on R, and I have magnetic field, which depends on R. And now minimizing this free energy. With respect to the one of the variables and magnetic field, I will find the minimum of this functional. I will find two equations, two system of coupled equations, which connect my wave function and magnetic field. Okay? This is the problem. So, how to take this variation? We all know that if we have a function, fx. Then to take a derivative f prime x is a limit of fx plus delta x minus fx divided by delta x when delta x goes to zero. This is how we take the derivative of function. How do we take the variational of function? I will take phi, and as I said, I have two variables, psi and psi star, therefore I can take deviation of one variable, minus phi star star star, and I will then assume that delta take a limit where delta psi star goes to zero. This is what I'm going to do. So basically in the integral form, I will recollect and rewrite all terms such a way that they will be proportional to uh, this delta psi star. And I will request that the coefficient in front of delta psi star uh, should go, should be equal to zero. This is a way to derive first equation and to derive second equation I will take limit phi at psi psi star and actually a plus delta a here I also have a vector potential but it doesn't change minus phi psi psi star delta a, a sorry and I take limit delta a so this is plan for Friday. This is plan for today. Okay. This is called variational procedure, or this is variational calculus when I take a functional derivative yeah. or Professor? variation by function. So in order to do it, I have three types of terms. This one this one and that one. Let me start with a calculation psi psi star, namely this one. Sorry, Professor. I'm saying that I take the deviation. You, you can speak louder. Sorry? Okay. Yeah, Professor, I wanted to ask uh, about uh, can we just use uh, uh, Lagrange multipliers for for this uh, other parameters for the minimization? No, no, we are going to uh, find what I call d free energy over d psi star, delta psi star, and delta to zero. So this is minimization. We are finding extremum of 
this function. And we don't use any Lagrange parameters because the theory is complete. I have this function. I need to minimize it. The same way as we find extreme function computing derivative and um, saying that in the extreme of a function, meaning of extreme of our function, minimum or maximum, we need to request that derivative is equal to zero. This is absolutely the same method, but instead of derivatives, we use functional derivatives or variation of function in order to minimize. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was asking because I thought if we have a lot of uh, dependence, uh, dependencies or functionals for the other parameter, here I think is is we just have two. If we if we look at condition in which we have a lot yeah. of them, yeah. No, we just have three, and I will write this term by term. Okay. So first of all, sorry, this is this term, which I'm going to take the deviation. So this is the psi modulo squared plus psi delta psi star. Basically, as I said. I would like to rewrite my phi as a phi node plus some integral over the r. I will have a delta psi star here and something the rest. And I will request that the rest is equal to zero. So I need to write, sorry, delta phi. I would like to present my delta phi as integral where I have a delta psi star multiplied to something. And this something will be precisely the function of derivative. Because then I take delta phi of a delta psi equal to zero, which will automatically mean that what is in my bracket is equal to zero. Okay? And therefore, I need to massage my functional such a way that I am able to present it in this form. And this is the first step. So this term, this term, which will be a psi star plus delta psi star psi minus a psi modulo square, this is equal to a psi delta psi star. So variation of the first term is this. Okay? Mm, professor, why don't we consider the variation of the psi? Variation of what? Of psi. Here you the consider the variation of psi. Star are two independent variables. My other parameter is two component, and I can take real part of psi and imaginary part of psi as two independent variables. But similarly, I can use psi and psi, psi star as two independent variables. Um, and I'm taking variation with respect to one. I have two arguments, and I'm interested only in functional derivative <coughs> in the direction of psi star. Of course, I can repeat all my calculation taking variation of psi, but it will not bring anything new. You will see that this equation will just be complete conjugate. It's enough to write down one equation. And this is important point that contrast to the theory with a scalar or the parameter, I have a two component or the parameter, and I must choose two linearly independent variables. And you can see that psi and psi star or psi prime plus i psi double prime, la prime, which is psi, and psi prime minus i psi double prime, which are psi star, I can choose either this or psi and psi star, and psi prime and psi double prime, real part and imaginary part. Doesn't matter. I select taking psi and psi star as two linearly independent variables. Okay, yes. Good. So now I take term number two. Let me take it here.
it was the biggest problem we do with this storm. Magnetic field doesn't change. I don't consider it at all. So number two, I need to take term psi modulus to the four. And I write it down as a psi psi star square. Right? Now I take a deviation. I write it psi psi star plus delta psi star square. So this is then psi to the four, the first term, plus two psi modulus square. Yes. Psi delta psi star plus terms which are over delta psi star square. And since I'm interested in terms proportional to delta psi star, which I'm eventually going to set to zero, I disregard all high powers of small deviation of a delta psi star. So what I have here is this terms, just these two terms. Therefore, the deviation which I'm interested in, namely B half psi psi star plus delta psi star square minus B half psi modulus form is equal to B psi modulus square psi delta psi star. So you see, I already almost did my job. And what remains is to play with this term. And this is the most complicated part of the problem. I'm doing it slowly in order to show you how things work. So I have minus i h not no minus 2e over c a times psi modulus square. This term is minus i h not no minus 2e over c a psi multiplied by i h not no minus 2e over c a times psi star. This is identically. I wrote what does it mean model square. And now I need to take to replace psi star by psi star plus delta psi star. So what I have is minus i h not minus 2 over c a psi i h not minus 2 e over c a psi star plus delta psi star. Since I'm interested in difference, you see that the term with a psi, when I subtract um, corresponding uh, term in the functional will go. So I'm interested in terms in term minus i h not minus 2 e over c a psi i h not minus 2 e over c a delta psi star. And you see, I have a differential operator which acts on psi delta psi star. So I need to reorder and reshuffle uh, these terms in order to present it in the very same form where I have delta psi star in front. In order to do it, in order to do it, let me add the full derivative. This is important moment. 
please, please. This is very important for understanding. Let me write the following form. If I take operator nabla, apply it to delta psi star times minus i h nabla minus 2 e over c a. Let me do this exercise. So I'm taking gradient of the product. The gradient of the product is equal to first I apply um, it to um, the uh, yeah first one. So this is delta applied to uh, delta psi star. I need it because I have this term, right? Uh, times this is nabla applied to this term times minus i h nabla minus two e over c a psi plus now this term over delta psi star, and I'm applying derivative to the second term. So this is nabla times minus i h nabla minus 2 e over c a times psi. But here, here, you see that this nabla will act on this term and again it will act on the product. It will act on the product of a vector times psi. Therefore, I need to make a separate yet additional assumption. My theory is gauge invariant, and in order to simplify my calculation, I can assume that nabla times a or divergence a is equal to zero. So this is additional assumption based on gauge invariance of my theory. Then differentiating this product, <coughs> I don't differentiate a, I just differentiate my uh, uh, the way function. If I now look back, I would like to re-express this term in terms of full derivative and this one. So I multiply it by i h, i h bar. I have i h bar here, um, and I have i h bar there. And let me now rewrite my function. Okay, so I'm writing delta f, which is then equal to integral over dr. I'm collecting uh, these two first terms, which I just erased. This is a psi plus b psi modulus square psi times delta psi star plus um, I will write uh, this term i h over 4m and I write this total derivative um, delta psi star multiply minus i h nabla minus p e over c a. So this is a full derivative. Now I'm writing minus i h over 4m i h over 4m and let me collect everything well let me write it in different you can, you can check 
that I write, that I would like to write in this way. So this is plus one over four m delta psi star times i h square number psi. This is this. You see that I have uh, i h in front and yet another i h, um, which gives me i h square and sine is plus, and I have a Laplace M. Then I have two times two e over c a i h number psi, and then I have plus two e over c a square psi. Good. So I have three types of terms, and I can already collect this one and that. For the term in the middle, I use the Gauss theorem. The Gauss theorem tells me that the integral of a volume of gradient of some function is equal to. Uh, there should be psi somewhere here, right? Sorry. Um, the Gauss theorem tells me that the integral of the divergence of some vector C is equal to integral over the surface of the vector C. C. This is Gauss theorem. Therefore, I can transform this integral of a volume of a divergence of some function by the integral of a surface of the angle i h over 4 m. And I have delta psi star minus i h number minus 2 over C A times Psi. So this is a vector. I have a surface integral and I have a volume integral. Since surface and volume integral are completely independent, I should request in my variation that both multipliers are equal to zero. And the volume integral, namely nullifying what is written in the first and the last term gives me <coughs> the equation and the surface term at the boundary of uh, the superconductor gives me boundary condition. Good. So, summarizing, I see that this is a full square, and I see then that my first Ginsburg Landau equation is equal to minus h squared over 4m, nabla minus 2ie over hc a square psi plus a psi plus b psi modulo square psi is equal to zero. This is this term, this term, and this term. And you see that it resembles very much the non-linear Schrodinger equation, which we considered before for the bosons. And then, in addition, I need to request that my surface integral is equal to zero, which gives me that the normal times the vector minus i h number minus 2e over c a times psi on boundary is equal to zero. So what I got, I got nonlinear differential equation for the wave function, and I have a condition on the boundary by applying Gauss theory that the integral of volume of divergence of some vector is equal to integral of a surface of which can find this volume 
of this vector. And by the way, you use one of the applications is ground theorem when you studied electrostatics, when you computed um, electric field of point like charges, you apply the ground theorem and you immediately got uh, this field as a function of radius for sphere, for cylinder, for anything you like to get. If you talk about point charges, you put sphere. If you talk about wire, you put cylinder. Um, yeah. So, this is all what I wanted to derive today. On Friday, we will take a deviation of the vector potential and we'll take the derivation of uh, variation of our function with respect to the vector potential. And we will get a second equation which connect us the vector potential with the wave function. So we have two um, fields, namely two component wave function and magnetic field. So we will have a system of two coupled nonlinear differential equations, which we will then use for description of various attacks um, in the vicinity of the phase transition point. Good. Any questions? I understand that this is tough. You probably never did this functional derivative before. So you need to digest it. Um, but you see, I didn't make any assumption about microscopic nature of superconductivity. What are the characters? What is the mechanism of pairing? Why we have this? I only assume that superconductivity is superfluidity of charged liquid and this is a quantum phenomenon which can be um, interpreted in terms of the global wave function. And as a result, I first derived my first equation for the behavior of superconductor in the presence of magnetic field. Can you still hear me or you're completely detached? Oh, we can hear you fine, Professor. Good. Again, uh, if you look at my previous recordings, you may find that I uh, used to use a bit different sequence of lectures. So I used to spend complete lecture for derivation of the ginsburg landau equations. And then uh, I come to the barden cooper schrickel macroscopic theory but before landau ginsburg theory, I also discussed electro-column interaction and Cooper pair problem. So I decided since the um, Cooper pair problem and electron phonon interaction is not needed for derivation of ginsburg landau equations. So I decided to split derivation of ginsburg landau equations in two lectures. Uh, and then when we completed and discussed Joseph Solipet, for which I also don't need, um, microscopic theory. Then next week, I will dwell into the microscopic theory. So introduce electron phonon interaction, show you that uh, the electron phonon interaction, um, uh, that interaction of two electrons thanks to electron phonon interaction in the vicinity of Fermi surface results in attraction. Then I see, I show you that the problem, two electron problem with attraction results in the bound state, which is Cooper pair. We probably uh, compute uh, this um, critical current, which is necessary to destroy Cooper pair. And then I will spend whole lecture for the microscopic theory of superconductivity, uh, applying the value of transformation to diagonalize fermionic semitonium. Uh, this is bargain Cooper Schrieffer theory. And basically, all these three or four lectures which I'm giving to you, each of them resulted in a Nobel Prize. So the Nobel Prize was given to Ginsburg for precisely construction of Ginsburg Landau theory. This is, by the way, 1950. And then Barden Cooper Schrieffer got the Nobel Prize for the creation for construction of the microscopic theory of superconductivity. Josephson uh, got the Nobel Prize for discovery of Joseph Solitech, and basically my lecture more or less follow uh, the uh, papers which 
after some time uh, were awarded by the Nobel Prize. So you see how we proceed with the, with the scores. And this is very important, actually. This is really very important theory, very influential theory, which really changed the mind and direction of theorists of the 20th century. Okay. If there are no questions, I'm done for today. You are free to disconnect. And uh, Massimo uh, is writing that he uh, adjusted some audio settings. Now it's much better. Thank you, Massimo. I hope we proceed the very same way privately, but if you feel that some more sound adjustment is needed, please let me know. I will probably come like five minutes or even 10 minutes before private lecture starts. And we check and recheck everything again in order to be able to concentrate on physics, but not on uh, the technical problems. So I invite those of you who would like to test system also to come a bit early on Friday to be able to check everything with me. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Then till Friday. And Friday I will try to send to everybody the homework. Because now it's time you can solve maybe two thoughts of the homework. So it's time to send it to me.